I'm introducing Brother Dub. I think most know about him. And uh, he, he suffers a great deal of the slings and arrows of life's outrageous fortune relative to his advanced age. Now, you know, the older I get, the more I'm happy I got that old. Uh, you know, we, in our society, we make fun of folks getting older. It's rather interesting when you go into the Far East, if you want to find out how to revere age. Brother Dub, do you remember when we were with our rice and went up into China? And brother, brother, believe it or not, we were younger in those days, but Brother Rice was still considered to be rather elderly to them. Well, we'd say back home, they toted him around on a stick. It was, uh, it's amazing to see, when we went into mainland China in particular, how, how re- revered the older people are. Um, 20 years ago. Yeah. 1995. 1995. Woo! I was a little younger then. She already looked at the picture here today, and she said, I was looking at pictures back when the lecture shit was 20. She said, you know, 20 years does make a difference on y'all. Right, now, you figure out how I'm supposed to take that, my wife. But <laughs> I couldn't respond like I normally would to somebody else out here. Could you, buddy? Okay. <laughs> now, Ken might, but we all have mercy on Nancy. <laughs> so, Nancy is always... Uh, Always very strong and resilient for the burden she has to bear. <laughs> but this has been a, a, a good time, a brief lectureship. I do want to mention just one thing as I, before we turn it over to Brother Dub. I'll, I'll remind us of it at the end if, if I don't forget it. <laughs> we'll be back to our old schedule at least next year. Starting on a Wednesday night and going Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and ending at this time on Sunday. Lord willing, I say. We already have everything set to go. And the theme will be a fatal error on the Holy Spirit. And uh, we have a considerable amount of the manuscripts in. We have a considerable amount of manuscripts still out. <laughs> But everything is still pretty much set to go, and Lord willing, we'll be able to get it together. And we'll see where things go after next year as far as what the future holds, any changes of, um, of arrangements as to how we'll do the lectures. But right now, it's still set to be as it has been. And we hope you'll keep the lectureships in your prayers and that we will, that we will be able to see it advance in all over the country as far as influencing people through the teaching that we do. So be sure and be mindful of that. But about this lectureship, I don't think we could have had a better one. It's been well attended. Uh, I've enjoyed every one of the lectures. And uh, I can say that this year because I didn't speak at any of them. So, and uh, everybody goes, and, and the congregation says, Amen. So, <laughs> But right now we'll be listening to Brother Dub speak to us on a very horrible topic, but a, a reality topic of what's around us. Pornography, pedophilia, and sexual immorality. And as bad as that may be to us who labor to be what God says we ought to be in morality and all other godliness, that's the world God has given us to work in to sound out the gospel, the power of God to save to all these people. And it's the only thing that can lead them out of this. There's nothing else. So it needs to be discussed in the proper manner. And I knew that Brother Dub would do a good job. And I thought this would be one to close out on. And so Brother Dub McClish, come speak to us. I'm still trying to <clears throat> reconcile in my mind uh, what David had against me for giving me this subject. <laughs> it would not have been the subject of my choice. It would not have been a subject that I would have prepared a sermon on for the North Point congregation, though I would mention some of these things occasionally in 
sermons that I preach, and yet to devote an entire study to them would be an entirely different thing. But as David has indicated, uh, there is a need for addressing this subject, or these subjects. It's a combination of subjects, actually. Before we start our um, study of this, I want to uh, acknowledge uh, how thankful I am to be among you, be with you, and uh, you surely know here at Spring that I count this congregation as very dear and dear to my heart. I believe I was uh, at and on the first lectureship, which was a firm foundation lectureship, as I recall. And I had to take a uh, sabbatical of about five years while I was editing the Gospel Journal because I uh, simply had to get rid of some load somewhere. But I still came down for the lectures uh, during those years uh, just to be uh, a part of the congregation, the festivities, and uh, the great lessons and so forth. And you all have been exceptionally kind and gracious to me. And, of course, I count David, a dear uh, fellow soldier of the cross, as we fight the good fight of the faith. And I know he and I and all of the others who try to stand tall in the Lord's army and are so often out in front when so many of you are not, yet your work of holding our hands up is every bit as essential as the work that we do. And I express my appreciation to Ken and Buddy for uh, their work as elders here, and uh, that's a very special thing to me because for now almost 10 years they have been overseeing my work and receiving my support funds and distributing them to me and making sure that all that's done honorably and, and above board. You know, um, <clears throat> Ken is a CPA, and I know Buddy just trusts him with all of that. And I, uh, I did come across a new... Uh, new name for what CPA stands for. A couple of weeks ago it says uh, uh, Chicken Pluckers Assistant. <laughs> and when I mentioned that to Ken, he said he'd rather be the assistant than, than the chicken plucker himself. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, he, he can pluck the chickens pretty good. <laughs> and, uh, of course, to uh, Buddy Burnell for... Uh, putting up with me in their home for I've lost count of how many years, but it's been many, many, and we uh, kind of get along together like uh, family, and uh, I deeply appreciate that, and I keep hoping that the room service will pick up a little bit, but I, <laughs> I still have to serve my own plate. I don't think you get, not even brought to the table for me, but uh, I can put up with such hardships uh, for a while. I've about reached the point in life where when I go into a restaurant and order my meal, they ask me to pay in advance. But uh, <laughs> you all just keep on kidding me, and I'll keep on laughing as long as I got laugh. <laughs> Let's turn our attention to this subject now. Uh, we're going to have to be thinking about and discussing behaviors that are not pleasant for pure minds to dwell upon. And yet the climate in which we live forces us to do so. We cannot escape it anymore. It's in our face on the billboards we see. It's in the television commercials. It's just all about us. But this age is uh, not unique in that respect. Think of the atmosphere in which the New Testament was written. Outside of the very small area where most of the Jews still call their homeland then, sexual immorality ran rampant throughout the Roman Empire, in the Greek cities, in the Asian cities. And the gospel began to be preached in that atmosphere. We should then be very surprised if the New Testament did not address these very subjects 
in a very open way and a very full way. It does so respectfully and sensitively, and we'll try to do the same. Now, there are three things in my topic, pornography, pedophilia, and sexual immorality. I'm going to reverse the order of those because the first two are basically expressions of the third. God created mankind with sexual desires and instincts. These are not acquired. They did not come through millions of years of evolution. Men have had these instincts from the beginning. Let's look at a few passages. Genesis 1, 27 and 28, And God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Now, I didn't bring a frog with me. But I do want to use an illustration. There have been a few uh, remarks made about... Uh, Ken and Buddy's plumber expertise this week. Plumbers know that there are male and female joints in plumbing. And electricians know that there are male and female connectors in electricity. That goes all the way back to what I just read you try to hook up a male joint to a male joint in plumbing, and you got worse than disaster. And you try to do the same with electricity, and you have nothing to connect, no way to connect them. God knew what he was doing. Genesis 2.18, Jehovah God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. That means suitable for him appropriate for him. Well, that involves more than just the sexual differences between man and woman, but it surely includes them. Genesis 2.24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Again, that involves more than just the sexual union, but it surely includes it. It's a part of that fleshly intimacy that a husband and wife should have. In Genesis 4 and verse 1, the man knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain. Here we have a euphemism, the word new for the sexual union by which the race is propagated. Genesis 16 verse 4, Concerning Abraham, and he went in unto Hagar, Sarah's handmaid, and she conceived and bare Ishmael. Went in unto is a phrase often used in the Bible to refer to the sexual union. Genesis 39 verse 7, Potiphar's wife said to Joseph, come lie with me. That term is used repeatedly in the Old Testament as well in reference to the sexual bed. We should not then be surprised that the Bible discusses sexual behavior and the sexual appetite which God has given to mankind. It is as honorable as the appetite for food, as the instinct for self-preservation, and for comfort rather than discomfort. But as with all God-given appetites, God has placed boundaries upon them lest we destroy ourselves by engaging in them. And so he has with the sexual instinct and the sexual appetite. He limits the fulfillment of this instinct and appetite to marriage between a man and a woman who have the God-given right to be married to each other. And in no other circumstance does he allow, with his pleasure, the exercise of this activity. In 1 Corinthians 7, verse 2, 
Paul, in addressing this subject at some length in 1 Corinthians 7, as you know, said, but because of fornication, that is to avoid fornication, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Hebrews 13 verse 4 says, let marriage be had in honor among all and the bed undefiled. This is a euphemism for the bed of marriage, the bed of the sexual union. Let the bed be undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Judge in the sense of condemn. That which God desired then are designed to be honorable, pure, innocent, right, and even necessary. Man has taken and has corrupted it. He has dragged it into the sewer. He has defiled it and defaced it, profaned it in every way possible. That's why we must discuss these subjects today. Now to the term sexual immorality more specifically. Let's define these terms, not that we don't know what they mean, but let's refresh our minds. The term sexual pertains to thoughts, passions, behaviors that involve human reproductive instincts. Immorality has to do with the violation of standards, particularly a standard of right and wrong. Now, there is more to immorality than just sexual immorality. Gambling is a form of immorality. Lying is a form of immorality, dishonesty is. Stealing is. Violence is. Things of that kind, they are immoral. But we're talking about sexual immorality. That is violating standards that have been set for the use of the sexual appetite and instinct. So engaging in forbidden acts of sexual intimacy, the abuse or misuse of this God-given instinct. Now when we talk about sexual immorality, we imply that there is sexual morality. In matters of religion and state, as I pointed out Friday evening, there are only two sources of authority. God or man. Matthew 21, verse 25, Jesus said, The baptism of John, whence is it? From heaven or from men? The same is true uh, concerning the matter of standards for our sexual behavior. There are only two sources of that standard, from God or from man. If it's from God, then of course we today are under the New Testament since we've lived since the cross. All men who've lived since that time will be judged by what is in that standard, the New Testament. The other source of standard for men is purely subjective, is based upon what he wants to do, it is pleasure driven, it is humanistic and selfish to the core. And that's why our world's in the shape it's in today, it's chosen the wrong standard. It's ever been so since man was created. What Jeremiah, Jeremiah wrote in chapter 10, verse 23. The way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Men need guidance from outside themselves or an objective standard. Sexual immorality as it's represented in the New Testament is made known to us by several terms and expressions. Some of these are specific, some of them are general, and we'll look at some of both kinds. There are two specific terms. We'll mention some Greek terms, though we're not going to try to give a lesson on Greek, but I think it's important to know the origin of some of these words. The Greek word pornea is the word from which fornication is translated in our King James and American Standard versions. 
I do not know the explanation as to why the translators were not consistent in translating the term that way in the New King James Version. Sometimes it's sexual immorality, and other times it's fornication for the very same word, this word pornea. I believe the King James and American Standard are better in this respect in being consistent with it. But this primarily, this word fornication from pornea refers to illicit sexual unions by those not married as marriage is defined by God. But it's broad enough to cover other forbidden unions as well. In 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 1, where Paul begins uh, rebuking the Corinthians because they're harboring a fornicator in their midst, well, what was his fornication? He had taken his father's wife, his stepmother, committed adultery with her. And yet fornication is the term that's used to describe that adulterous union. Same-sex intimacies are blasted by Paul in Romans chapter 1, verses 24 through 27, both lesbians and sodomites. Though they are not by Paul called in this context fornicators, they certainly meet the definition of pornea or fornicators because they're illicit unions. And then bestiality, I believe bestiality is the second pronunciation, is specifically, explicitly, in at least three passages forbidden in the Old Testament, in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Though this is not named specifically in the New Testament, certainly it constitutes pornea or fornication. It is an illicit union. Now the other specific term besides pornea that gives us fornication is moikeia which is the term translated adultery in the New Testament. It more specifically refers to a married person's sexual union with one other than one's spouse. Adultery sometimes is distinguished from fornication, therefore. Jesus did so in Matthew 15, verse 19, when he said, Out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, fornications, and adulteries. So you see the distinction. Likewise, Paul distinguished between them in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, when he is listing the things that will keep people out of the kingdom of God, out of which uh, some of the Corinthians had come in obeying the gospel. He said fornicators and adulterers. So again, the distinction made. And we've already noticed Hebrews 13, verse 4. Fornicators and adulterers God will judge, distinguishing between pornea and moikia. And yet at the same time, Jesus also described adultery as fornication. In Matthew 19 and verse 9 and Matthew 5 and verse 32. So you see the terms overlap somewhat and they're not absolutely, specifically <laughs> distinguishable from each other. But the more umbrella term is fornication, and adultery is a little more limited in its sense generally. In addition to these specific terms, numerous general terms in the New Testament refer to sexual misbehavior, lasciviousness, uncleanness, vile passions, that which is against nature, those without natural affection, unseemliness, effeminate, abusers of themselves with men, the defiled marriage bed of Hebrews 13 verse 4, and this is not all of the list. But you see, this is not a subject ignored by inspired New Testament writers. Such behavior, unrepented of, will keep one out of heaven. Paul made that clear in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. Those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. He made it clear again in an even longer list of works of the flesh, including fornication and adultery and lasciviousness and uncleanness in Galatians 5, 19 through 21. They who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. 
Hebrews 13, 4 made it clear, fornicators and adulterers God will condemn or judge. John made it clear in Revelation 21, verse 8, when he said, fornicators, among others, will be cast into the lake of fire with all liars. He's not a liar. He preached on it the other night. <clears throat> But you see, there are eternal consequences relative to these terms and uh, those behavior patterns. The sexual revolution, which is generally dated from the 1960s, perhaps about the mid-60s, that promised sexual freedom to our world has done nothing but enslave mankind to sex. The widespread abandonment of God's ordained marriage, family, and home institution over the past half century has corrupted the ultimate, intimate relationship possible between two human beings. Honorable, innocent sexual union has been made common and unclean. It has been defiled. It has been made a subject of crude and ribald humor. It has been dragged into the sewers. The parts of human anatomy that from Eden God himself covered in Adam and Eve. That it would be private except between a husband and wife alone. Have become those which are openly exposed for the public on every hand it seems. Sexual engagement has been reduced merely to another form of guiltless, casual, commitmentless recreation as inconsequential as a game of checkers or a hamburger date at the Sonic. Cohabitation, or as I think John put it, the folks in the southeast call it shacking up. Well, we knew that term in Texas, too. <laughs> But cohabitation between unmarried adults and the production of children from those unions has become commonplace. It is shameless. It is almost a trophy anymore to be engaged in that kind of life. It is thrown in our faces on every hand. It still constitutes fornication, whatever you call it. Illegitimate births have soared from 5% of our populace in 1960 to 41% now. And it is projected that within a very few years, more illegitimate babies will be born than legitimate ones. The threadbare moral fabric of our nation threatening its very survival is caused incalculable human misery and human idiocy. Who ever thought we would have to use an adjective to describe marriage for people to know what we're talking about? You can't just say marriage anymore. You've got to say heterosexual marriage if you mean between a man and a woman. And homosexual marriage is one of the greatest oxymorons of all time. And then there are the people who marry their dogs and their cats, as uh, Jeff reminded us of the other day, and even an Eiffel Tower wedding. And I read of a man a couple of days, a couple of weeks ago, who said he was seduced by a dolphin. And there's just no end to such foolishness. The abandonment of God's limitation of sex knows no bounds, it would seem. Now, with this brief review of sexual immorality in general, let's move to these other two terms, pornography and pedophilia. A principal demonstration of the sexual enslavement of our times is pornography. I tell you, I with fear and trepidation, did any research on the Internet on this subject. I feared to put the word pornography in my search blank. 
I didn't learn until after I'd done this research from my granddaughter. She said, well, Grandy, don't you know there's a safe search setting on your search boxes? I said, no, I didn't know that. I just lucked out. And so she took me to it. And uh, I use Bing. You all use Google maybe or Yahoo or some other. But I know Bing and uh, Google both have a setting that will not allow a lot of this trash to come in. It'll filter it out. And I've got mine set now, but I didn't before I did the research. But fortunately, I put in statistics on pornography. <laughs> and that seemed to shield me from what I might otherwise have had staring me in the face. I highly recommend that you set yours to safe search, by the way. You never know what innocent word you're going to put in that may be one of the hundreds of words the pornography industry, Lust Incorporated, I call it, uh, may have to tag on that word and send it to your computer. So where do we get the word pornography? Again, it has Greek origins. It was coined in the 19th century. The porn part of it is related to the pornea that gives us fornication. So you see the family connection there. But it's porne actually, and it refers to, that's the word for harlot or whore or prostitute in the Greek language. And the word graphe, the graphe part of it, is graphene in the Greek, which is to write. And so originally this word in the 19th century was coined to describe writings about prostitutes. But it has evolved, as words generally do, to include any and all writings or graphic images. And today that would be whether in books or in movies or in digital reproductions or creations or by whatever means, matters are portrayed intended to stir up sexual desire or lust. The word lascivious is a good word to describe what they are designed to do. To say that uh, pornography is pandemic in our world is not a hyperbole. And it has only uh, grown and developed and become profuse in the past 50 years. Such things as are available on the checkout stands in our supermarkets today were hidden under counters if merchants carried them at all. You had to know where to go to look for them. And I was underprivileged as a youngster. I didn't know where to go to look for them. I didn't even know they existed. <laughs> I happened upon a little pornographic pamphlet when I was about 11 years old. I well remember it. My dad was a preacher, but he was also a barber. Generally, he preached in places where he couldn't put enough food on the table by what they paid him to preach, so he was also a barber. We lived in Burnett, Texas, and I was the shoe shine boy. I got my first job when I was eight years old shining shoes in a barber shop, and then shines were just ten cents a piece. But a little neighbor boy of mine came in, was visiting with me one time in the barber shop, and we started going through the drawers in the cabinet behind uh, where the owner of the barber shop lived and digging through stuff and he wasn't paying any attention to us and we came upon this little booklet and it had some pictures in there that we never had seen before <laughs> and some things that we never had thought about before and uh, we took it to him and asked him about it he said oh, oh let me have that <laughs> and he got rid of it right quick from us I don't know whether he burned it or not but he should have that was my introduction to pornography. I, I didn't know such things as that existed. But, you know, they were just were not available. But there are two factors that have caused this explosion of pornography. In 1970, the federal government estimated that the pornography, pornography industry was worth 10 million 
M million dollars. 2014 is estimated it was worth 13 billion dollars. Now the two factors involved in the proliferation have been uh, number one technological advances in photography, video, digital reproduction, and rapid distribution by means of the World Wide Web. That's what the WWW stands for, in case you've forgotten. It means it goes everywhere if you put it out there through your computer on the Internet. And the uh, number of people who have either computers or smartphones or tablets or all three who have availability through the World Wide Web to everything that's put up there. Anyone with these instruments and Internet connections is a couple of clicks away or a couple of touches away from the sewers, from absolute filth. So here is one of the, the great factors, technology. The second one is the relaxation of regulations and standards concerning how much skin and sexual activity can be portrayed in movies and television, and of course there are no regulations except one we'll mention in a moment concerning the Internet. Uh, if you watch television very much, uh, you're going to see sooner or later some Victoria's Secrets uh, commercials flash up there. They're pornographic, that's all you can call them. They might call it soft porn, but it's porn. <laughs> Um, the Sports Illustrated Special Editions. I go to a barber shop, get my hair cut, and they've got all kinds of magazines there, and in looking for Texas highways, I have to sift through some of that other stuff. <laughs> and the Sports uh, Illustrated uh, Swimsuit Edition, it, it's porno. I, I have uh, an email once in a while, that'll come in advertising Sports Illustrated uh, Special Edition, the Swimsuit Edition, and it will give you an opt-out. It realizes a lot of people don't want to see that stuff, but it's still going to produce it because there's so many who do, apparently. Last weekend, Fifty Shades of Grey, which I call Fifty Shades of Garbage, hit the theater. Now, you surely have not been able to escape the ads for this movie. It's a movie of a book, the first of a trilogy of books, I understand. I haven't read the book, and I won't see the movie. But it is uh, not only pornographic, but violent pornography, apparently, from the descriptions and reviews that I've read of it. And yet it is filling the theaters, people are standing in line to get their tickets, according to published reports. Raw pornography has gone mainstream from Hollywood. I remember the first movie that had such words as uh, seduction or had some subtle seductive scenes in it in 1953. I didn't see the movie. I was a 15-year-old kid. But I remember the discussion of the movie. The name of the movie was The Moon is Blue. You can Google it and find it on your Internet. It became somewhat of a landmark trial movie to see how far Hollywood could push the standards then. And it was able to push the standards and get the camel's nose under the tent that now has got the whole herd of camels under it. Took a while to do it, but the devil takes short steps. About the only salacious material that is still forbidden is child pornography. But how long will that last with all of the other standards that we never thought would be lowered? Internet pornography alone generates $3 billion annually. That's just the Internet. There are 4.2 million pornographic Internet websites. 
That's 13% of all of the websites. Most of these are free websites. They are bait to draw you in to the really rougher stuff that you have to pay for. And that's where they make their money. Many surveys indicate that a large percentage of professing Christians, this is talking about through the denominational world, regularly view pornography. And that among these, who are mostly men, though some women are involved, are included preachers who have admitted that they at least once in a while, seek out and watch some pornography on their computers. The arguments often made by those who have this terrible habit that it's a victimless behavior. What's wrong with it? Well, let's answer that. Uh, there are psychological effects of it. We're told by psychologists that the effects of pornography on the brain are very similar to the effects of hard drugs in their capacity for causing addiction. And that just as uh, one might start out with uh, marijuana, he might not be satisfied too long with marijuana. He's got to move a little bit higher to something stronger. And so it is with this. It might start with something that uh, is called soft porn, and then gets to the point that's not enough. He starts paying for the hard stuff, and then psychologists also say, and criminologists also say, that at times it gets so bad for them that they have to act out then what they are seeing in the pornographic violence. Thus, we shouldn't be surprised that uh, surveys implicate pornography in a large percentage of rapes and even in some serial murders. There's no way to calculate the number, but surely it's in the tens, if not the hundreds of thousands of homes destroyed by the fantasies fathered by pornography that have ruined loving, wholesome relationships between husbands and wives. Unsupervised children may be lured into terribly evil websites. Parents who do not supervise what their children are seeing on the internet are foolish indeed. A child should never be able to have a computer or any other instrument that's connected to the Internet in their room where they just in private view whatever they want to on that instrument. You are playing with fire, and you're inviting trouble. Pornography is a soulless beast that is helping to devour the very moral foundation of our nation. So there are psychological effects, there are social effects, but... There are spiritual consequences, and they are eternal. Our Lord said near the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, <clears throat> Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. How can one be pure in heart and see what pornography represents and is? If the pure in heart are going to see God, the impure who are impenitent, they're not going to see God. A little bit later in that same chapter, Matthew 5, verse 28, Jesus said, Everyone that looketh upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. That's what pornography really is. It's giving something for the lustful eye to look upon. The woman in that pornographic image is someone's daughter, might even be someone's wife. You are lusting after her by looking at that image. Jesus says, that's heart adultery. 
1 John 2, verses 15 and 16. John said, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life. Now that's two out of three. Lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye with pornography. It's of the world, it's not of the Father. And those who engage in such things, John goes on to say, have not the Father. They didn't have the pornographic capabilities that modern man has invented when John wrote those words. But the Holy Spirit was looking ahead and knew what was down the road because he knew what was behind. And he knew man's inclinations, man's desires, man's instincts, and the misuse as well as the proper use of them. And so he warns us. They certainly didn't have the capabilities back in Job's day that men have today of reproducing all of these images. But he said, I've made a covenant with mine eyes. How then should I look upon a virgin? Obviously to lust after her. Job 31 and verse 1. And Paul, it seems like, just stacks up the terms that would fit in here with pornography when he wrote in Colossians 3 and verse 5, Put to death therefore your members, that is your bodily members, which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. What does idolatry have to do with all of those other sex-related terms? The idol temples were afloat with sexual practices and prostitutes as a part of the religious practice. You could not separate the idolatry and the immorality of the first century idolatry. Philippians 4, verses 8 and 9, one of the most beautiful passages in Holy Writ, I believe. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honorable, just, pure, lovely, of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Here's someone sitting at a computer with lustful images flooding his mind and his heart with photographic images up here that he may never be able to get rid of, though he shuts that computer down. Preventing and overcoming the temptation and practice of viewing pornography apparently is very difficult to do, but it's not impossible. How do we do it? Well, of course, the Christian is way ahead here. If a Christian has become involved in this, and don't think that members of the church are immune to it, but we need to keep our spiritual batteries charged. Romans 12 and verse 2, Paul says, Be not conformed to our American standard, fashioned according to the world. But be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The mind that's been corrupted with these things must be renewed. But if we keep our minds filled with the Word of God in the first place, we won't be viewing these things unless it's by a sheer accident. And then it won't be viewing them long. The 119th Psalm, verse 11 says, Thy word have I hid or stored up in my heart that I might not sin against thee. This will be the preventive measure to keep us from these things. If we happen upon them, Paul's instruction in 1 Corinthians 6.18 tells us what to do. Flee fornication. Turn that thing off. Get on your knees and pray. Open your Bible and read some of these appropriate passages. If you can't resist the temptation because you've got the internet, get rid of your internet. In the context where Jesus said, everyone that looketh upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery already in his heart, he says, if your right eye offends you, pluck it out. 
Well, let's paraphrase that a little bit. If your internet offends you, if you can't control your internet, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that thy internet connection perish than to let thy whole body perish in hell. If only God knows that one has been involved in this, confess your sins to God and pledge your repentance that you will not do this anymore and don't do it. Brethren, we must guard against this. It's constantly trying to ensnare us. But let's hasten on and give a few remarks to pedophilia. (laughs) Greek language again. It's from two Greek words. The Greek word for child, paida, P-A-I-D, it would be in our uh, characters. And philia, the Greek word for love that has to do with affection and family affection and friendship and things of that kind. Put together, you have a child lover. And this uh, was coined in the 19th century to describe the primary or exclusive sexual attraction of an adult for a child. Now you see the same root word with your word pediatrician. He's a child doctor. And so pediophile is a child lover. The medical definition involves the upper age of a child who would be the prey of the pedophile as 13 years. But a diagnostic of a person who is a pedophile says that he must be 16 years or older and there must be at least five years of difference between the pedophile and the victim. A pedophile may or may not be homosexual. Most of them seemingly are homosexual and male. Not all pedophiles are child molesters. And not all child molesters are pedophiles. They cross at various places and overlap at various places, but they're not identical things. There are some organizations that are pushing very hard to normalize pedophilia. Uh, Jeff mentioned this uh, in some of his remarks. He mentioned uh, NAMBLA, particularly the North American Man Boy Love Association, that's obviously a uh, homosexual uh, driven uh, institution. It uh, is not as strong as some other organizations that are pushing for pedophilia right now in the United States. Now, there are several of these organizations in various nations. But the one that seems to be most active right now in America is called Before You Act. The letter B, the number 4, the letter U, dash, A-C-T. And it exists to promote and normalize pedophilia by using the same tactics the homosexual element has used to gain its normalcy state before so many of our fellow citizens. They like to use such euphemisms for their behavior as minor attracted persons, that's what we are, or it's just intergenerational sex. Oh, how the devil likes to use words in various ways. Well, what about the prevalence? An estimated 4% of the male population and a smaller percent of the female population are pedophiles, either in practice or fantasy. Now, they found out the ones who are in fantasy, I don't know. <laughs> but you can see there's a lot of guesswork here. They, they're having to uh, extrapolate some of the hard figures that they get to other portions of the populace. The most frequent offenses of molestation and abuse by adults are by those in roles of trust with children, and you would expect that. And this has to do with religious leaders. Mohammed in the seventh century married a six-year-old girl when his wife died, 
but he mercifully waited three years until she was nine years old to take her to his marriage bed. Last week, I received an email that told of a 40-year-old Muslim man in Yemen who married an eight-year-old girl, and she died from internal injuries from her wedding night. He was simply following the example of his prophet, Mohammed. In 1950 and up to 2012, the Roman Catholic Church spent $3 billion plus to settle over 3,000 claims of pedophilia against its priesthood. But most of those came in the last 20 years. Between 2004 and 2011, eight Catholic dioceses had to declare bankruptcy because they couldn't pay the claims of pedophilia. But it's not restricted to Catholicism. Non-Catholics are involved. Occasionally even some brethren become involved. I know of at least three preaching brethren, two of whom served time in prison. Youth directors seem to be... uh, those at times that are particularly involved in such. Then there are school personnel, coaches and teachers. It's said that administrators often look the other way when they know that something not right is going on between a teacher and a student because they do not want the glare of the spotlight of the public put upon them. They do not want a lawsuit. They do do not want to go to court over such things. But by legal definition, students in the school, for the most part, are all minors who are incapable of giving consent to sexual overtures. And I think in most states, maybe in all states, teachers are forbidden to have any sort of intimate or romantic relationship with a student, even if the student is 18 years old in their class. The most notable case of pedophilia, I guess, over the past few years was Jerry Sandusky, the Penn State coach, who in 2011 was found guilty in 45 cases of pedophilia and will uh, end his life in jail where he ought to. An increasing number of cases are female teachers who seduce their male students. In researching this, I got on one website, and um, it had the pictures of 211 female teachers who either had been convicted of pedophilia uh, with a student or who were awaiting trial or who had already paid damages. And some of these were wives and mothers of children themselves, and they've seduced a student in their classroom. Many cases involve incest. A grandfather, an uncle, a stepfather, even a brother or a father taking sexual liberties with their children. And then there's scouting and other youth organizations that bring uh, someone of trust in connection with children. Besides the natural revulsion that normal folk, especially the Lord's people, have for such, what can we see in the Bible about it? It's not addressed directly in the New Testament that I've been able to find, but let's look at some principles. Romans 15, verse 1, Paul said, The strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. Now, the context has to do with whether you're going to eat meat or whether you're going to eat just vegetables. And incidentally, the meat eaters are the strong folks <laughs> in that context. And the vegetarians are the weak folks. Don't doubt it, they don't get all that protein they need. <laughs> but the point is, Paul says it doesn't make a hill of beans to God whether you just eat vegetables, you eat meat and vegetables. That doesn't have anything to do with your salvation. And those of you who are stronger ought not to judge 
those who are weaker. And the weaker should not try to impose their views on the stronger, or their practice anyway. But the strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. Well, that overlaps in a lot of ways, doesn't it? And has a lot of application. And it does to this subject. The strong ought to be the adults. They are the mature ones. The younger ones are the weak, the innocent ones. And here we have with pedophilia the strong taking advantage of the weak instead of bearing their infirmities and protecting them. We see another principle in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 8. If any provide not for his own, he's denied the faith and is worse than an infidel or unbeliever. Providing for one's own is a sweeping principle. Food, clothing, shelter, protection is involved in that too. And in pedophilia, you have someone absolutely failing in protecting the youngers. They are preying upon the youngers. Pedophilia if taken to the extreme of sexual union, becomes fornication. And so certainly it is addressed in that way. But even if it is not taken to the extreme of a union, if there is only fondling or something else, you've got uncleanness, you've got vile passions, you've got unnatural affections, and all of those other terms that the New Testament uses to describe the heinousness of this behavior. From Romans chapter 1, from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, from Galatians chapter 5, from Revelation chapter 21, from Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 4, those folks, unless they repent, are not going to be in heaven. There is no known cure for pedophilia, though there are some treatments that are being tried. These are to try to prevent the acting out of the pedophilia. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13 should be of value for the Christian. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. He goes on to say that God will, with the temptation, make a way of escape. But we've got to take hold of the doorknob and open the door to take the way of escape. We've already noticed the 119th Psalm, verse 11. Thy word have I laid up or hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. But uh, think about one more passage. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, which is so broad in its scope. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. The man of God may be perfect or complete, Furnished or thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Pedophilia is not a good work. The Bible student, the Bible lover, the Bible obeyer cannot be involved in pedophilia because he's going to be involved in good work, not bad. We live in a very dark time in a very dark place, a very dark world in which almost unimaginable things are being done between adults and toward children. The public degeneracy and hostile attitudes toward behavior and teaching that condemn such behavior represent an unusual challenge to the people of God today. Let's redouble our feasting on the Word of God, brethren. Let's increase our prayer life. Let's lean upon one another for strength and support. When we come into the assembly of the saints, we're, we have a recluse, a, a place where we can come apart from that world out there, even for a few minutes at a time. That refreshes our souls. The Lord knew what he was doing when he set it up at least every seven days that we are to meet. But then we need more than that, don't we? And so we supply a little time in the middle of the week to help us to get from this Sunday to that Sunday. 
But then we've got to read our Bibles every day. We've got to stay in close contact with God through prayer every day. How badly our world needs to see the light of the gospel, the light of the Lord, through the reflection that we give to the world in our own lives of that glorious light. Let us shun all of these terrible evils. Well, in one sense, it was ending 